good afternoon, students. Um, well, let me say good afternoon to the TEFS 701 Senior Phase uh, First Additional Language students. Um, we are now going to, I thought today would be wise for just to give an update of your SS1 assignment. So that would be your first assignment. That's due on the 4th of April. Um, and I think that's on Tuesday. So I'm just going to share my slides quickly with you. And then we can go into it. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, so here I've got my slides ready. So let's start. So this is going to be a TFS 701, um, that case study overview. Okay. So what's a case study? A case study is something that we do where we're trying to get knowledge, subject, research, method, criteria, the case, uh, data, evidence, and conclusions. That is what we want to look for in a case study. And just a bit of news again, submission date will be on the 4th of April, 2023. Uh, that will be for the senior phase students. That will be all of my students for the FETs. Those are, that are doing um, your senior phase as well as FET, yours will be submitted on the 6th of April. Uh, the Turnitin has, has been enabled for students, so please be aware of that. A Turnitin reports must be 30% and less. I had a student that asked me yesterday, She, I think her correlation was about 34%, and I said to her, no, that's acceptable. So we can make that 35% and less. And then you need to understand, that, because we're going to give this question again, that there's two different case studies. So the FET and the SPs are definitely not doing this case study. The questions might be the same, but the content of the case study is not the same. So please take that into consideration. Now, when we're looking at your SSI, the case study challenge, what do we mean with it? I'm sure that there's quite a few of you that have seen the case study or work through it again. So the FET SP CLT case study um, is basically a communicative language teaching case study. Now I need to just mention this that I have uploaded uh, Marcel Harrens's communicative language communicative language teaching case study because it it will work both for SP and FET students. So it's on, if you go to Quicklinks 3, you'll find it there. And then again, the Ferreira for case studies, that's page 89 to 92. So again there, please be aware of it, that you can practice a case study example. It's in Ferreira and it's on in page 89 to 92. So these will be answered on Canvas, please, Please take note, all questions will be answered on Canvas. You cannot ask the, uh, answer these questions anywhere else. I would advise you to write your answers onto a document. And normally, you will write your answers on a, you can do, you can type out your answers on a work document, but you have to upload it eventually onto Canvas. Again, you will get two opportunities to up, uh, upload your answers, but after that, there will be no opportunities given. Please take note, that is going to be for all students. So you have two opportunities. You can do it on a Word document and then you upload the answers onto Canvas. You'll just have to practice a bit how to do that. So these questions will be answered on Canvas. I mean, you've seen the SSI assignment. It's on Canvas. We've mentioned it a few times already. So make sure that you have that information, that you, 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 you actually have the case study in front of you and that you are capable of answering it on Canvas. Okay, so these are the questions. So they're talking about language teaching approaches already in text one, whether this approach will be, whether the, the, the case study uses a text-based approach and communicative. I think in both cases, in, in if you look at question one, you must figure out if it's te text-based. So if it's text-based, has the teacher actually used a text? So you need to read that article very carefully. Um, I'm sure that it's all about study selfies for SP. So read if it's text space. If it is text space, what, what did she give to the students? So what did she give the students beforehand? 
so that they know. So if it's text space, maybe there was a silly selfie article that will make a text space. So that she's given them an article to read um, beforehand. Uh, learners become, so if it's text space and there's an article, why did she use that? Is it to provide, that it helps the students to provide them with authentic text? Is that the answer? Um, does, if it's text space, uh, article that is it is it more does it become does will the students become critical readers so that's very important to look at as well if you're going to look at communicative um what what about communicative language um approach has been applied in this question so you will say learners ex maybe the learners were exposed to the target language target language would be they were exposed to English in this case, which would be they were exposed to speaking, reading, writing, etc. And because of communicative, when it's um, when any text is communicative, it means that they have been given opportunities to practice and produce language in groups. So, is that how? So you need to explain if the question is text-based and then what makes it text-based and then how did the teacher apply it? If it's communicative. Uh, what makes it communicative and how has the teacher applied it in the classroom? I hope that gives you more clarity in terms of answering that question. Okay, so um, let's go further. So the second question from the case study identifies six communicative practices that were used. Support your answers with quotations from the text. And so here are 10 examples, practices, CTL practices. If you need to identify six. And if you identify six, you need to take extracts from the text, from the case study to support your answer. So for example, if you're going to say that um, scaffolding learning was used, um, what, 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 how did the teacher scaffold the lesson for the learners? If your example said using group or peer work were used, you need to take from the text, from the case study, um, what areas where group work were used. And that needs to then be, obviously, if you're taking it directly from the quick text, it needs to be in quotation marks. It's very important to add that. So you need to it's take from the 10, take six. You need to look at six different areas and then take from the text. Uh, quotations to support your answer. Um, I, I hope that that gives you a little bit more clarity. Okay. Now, in order for us to do you, you to answer these questions, I'm going to talk a little bit about pedagogical content knowledge. And this is what they call PCK. So pedagogical, you know what that means, should mean by now, it's how you teach. And then the content is what you know as a teacher, but we need to combine the two, which will give you PCK. Okay, so now when you look at pedagogical knowledge, sorry, if you look at content knowledge, for example, content knowledge will be teachers know, they teachers should know and understand the subject they teach, as well as theories, produce procedures and frameworks. So you need to know how, the, the rule of, of, of active voice or, and passive voice or direct and indirect speech. So you need to know the content very well, okay? Pedagogical knowledge is when teachers know the te techniques and methods for instruction, including classroom management, lesson planning, and student evaluation. So the teacher knows the technique to the techniques in order to teach the content. Now, if you bring the two together, the pedagogical knowledge and the content knowledge, you will find what we call this pedagogical content knowledge. It's the combination of the two. And then if a teacher knows this combination, they will, the teachers can transform the subject matter for instruction and finding different ways to represent the material, okay? So that's one way of looking at it. So PCK, this pedagogical content knowledge, is teacher knowledge that concerns how teachers transmit their understanding of language content into forms that are accessible and attainable to the learners. So yes, at the there's content knowledge, but how 
are you going to teach this content? And that is what, well, uh, what we call the pedagogical content knowledge. Now, language content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge needed need, need to work together when you're teaching English in a classroom. So let's continue with PCK, which is your pedagogical content knowledge. So PCK in English teaching helps teachers to understand. So this is what happens when you understand the pedagogical knowledge and you understand the content knowledge. The combination helps the teacher to understand how to explore their language content knowledge. For example, genre types. You know, they need to understand the, the, um, the content knowledge. Essay writing. Active listening, visual literacy, academic literacy, referencing conventions, intensive reading practices, and contextualized grammar. Now, how to deliver the content knowledge using effective instruction to ensure learning achievements. For example, summarizing. So how are they going to deliver some of this content of summarizing to the students so that eventually they can understand the concept better. Listing, how they're gonna do questioning, collaborating, brainstorming, presenting, contrasting, comparing, describing, arguing, assessing, and critical thinking. How are they gonna do that? Okay, now when you look at knowledge about content and knowledge about learning, then it will give you knowledge about teaching. So the two has to work together. So this model of teacher knowledge is illustrated by Killen, 2015, page 31. Remember, Killen is one of the books that we also said you should get hold of for this module, for this course. Illustrates the model of teacher knowledge, Killen, illustrates how PCK is achieved at the intersection of con knowledge about language content. We explained that to you. And the knowledge about language learning and their knowledge about language teaching strategies. And you need to know all three in order for you to be a successful teacher, okay? And that's what we call pedagogical content knowledge, okay? So let's go on. Content knowledge for teaching language reading. So again, as I've said, you get content knowledge. Content is the content that you're supposed to teach. Pedagogical is how you do it. But this is going to be the focus here, is that content knowledge for teaching language reading. And this is how you need to, as a teacher, you need to know knowledge of speed reading techniques, like skimming, scanning, and surveying. So you need to know about that. You also need to know about knowledge of intensive reading practices. So that would be comprehensions, note-taking, summarizing, and then critical language awareness. You need to you need knowledge of pre-reading practices. I am sure that when you look at your assignment, there was a pre-reading exercise that the teacher gave the students. So uh, you need to know about this. I think she wanted to them to know about the, their prior knowledge on silly selfies, do they have any prior knowledge about that um, predicting, you know, so that's also a way of um, the students giving an understanding of what they know about the content that the teacher's giving them. You know, you also need to know about knowledge of during reading practices. So the teacher has to um, uh, look at uh, pedagogically how she will be able to get the knowledge uh, uh, during reading practices. And then the last one would be how word choice, use of language, imagery affecting meaning. So how does that work? And then comprehension strategies, inferencing and predicting. And then the next one would be knowledge of post-reading practices. That would be summarizing, drawing conclusions, evaluating applying structures of various genres, for example, poetry, short stories, drama, novels, and film studies. So, so we also need to know about content knowledge for teaching language, for teaching language. And then how do we do that writing? So you need the teacher need to know knowledge of the process writing approach. Next semester, you will be, you'll be doing a presentation on process writing, where you're going to have to 
talk about brainstorming, planning, drafting, revising, editing, and submitting. That's going to be a very important assignment that you're going to do. So you need to know how process writing works, for example. You also need to have knowledge of essay and transactional writing type structures. So what's an essay type would be a long piece of writing, a transactional writing type will be a shorter piece of writing, but you need to know the content of that, okay? Writing, you also need to know is how to write an introduction and conclusion, because knowing these things means that your students will be able to understand how to apply this in a question paper, for example. Structuring of paragraphing and text organization is also very important for your students when it comes to writing. And then referencing and in-text in text referencing conventions. Um, this is an area that you as teachers need to be very comfortable with in order to be able to uh, explain to your students about it. Now, content knowledge for teaching language. Why do we mean that? So you need to know things like knowledge of active listening techniques, like note-taking, questioning, summarizing, and paraphrasing. Also, when it comes to teaching language, you also need, when we're looking at speaking, you also need to know about knowledge of learners having opportunity to speak more, how they can engage and in acts of speaking. So we want interaction in our classroom. I mean, ideally the communicative language approach do not want classrooms to be silent where the teacher speaks 90% of the, 80% uh, of the time and the students speak 20% on the time of the time. In fact, we want a situation where teacher speaks 20% of the time and your learner speaks 80% of the time. So we want to have activities where students can engage in acts of speaking. They can look at areas in terms of uh, presentation skills, selecting topics to that they can talk about, obtaining information, etc., organizing information, so preparing visual aids and practicing and presenting. So these are all things that you uh, the teacher needs to know about. Then the content knowledge of teaching language, visual literacy, a very, very important area that cannot be ignored. What, what is being presented when the students are given a, lit, a visual literacy element, like for example, an advertisement. Um, so if you if you if this if the the teacher needs to have knowledge of various visual elements in advertisements, for example images, cartoons, pictures, posters, and chart, charts. And then <laughs> we just had this added this little cartoon. I like talking. I hate listening. I realized that. Yes. So this is what a student should be saying when they are in a communicative classroom is that the teacher allows them to talk and not just to listen. Okay. So analysis of verbal and nonverbal elements, for example, short, short, a uh, shot type and angles, focus, color. So verbal communication would be what is being said, but we also must take on consideration nonverbal elements, and these nonverbal elements are just as important. Your facial expressions also very important. It says a lot about the text or the visual in the text. Why? Um, why are certain people sad or happy in the visual? Uh, that the students must be able to explain that. So facial expressions are important, body language, kinesics would be body movements, uh, vocalics would be the voice, whether the voice is maybe sad or happy, or the tone is excited or, or sad, they need to look at that. Gaze would be the eyes, when they're looking at the eyes, is it happy eyes or sad eyes? What? And proxemics would be maybe two people standing next to each other. So how far apart are they? When you look at the visual element, why you need to, the, you need to teach your learners how to apply these, okay? We have a cartoon here. I mean, there's all these things in this visual can tell you so much about what's happening in that office, in the situation. Yeah. Now, content knowledge for teaching language grammar. Yes. Having knowledge of grammar rules. So, yes, that concord, 
if you have a singular subject, then you have as your verb must uh, agree with your subject, etc. Register, that would be the level of formality. For example, uh, what would be appropriate to use when you have an, a, an in very informal text, you would have slang, would you use slang, would you use informal language, or you use formal language, you have to look at those elements as well. So register is extremely important. Um, then academic discourse, also in grammar, that's important. Punctuation conventions, you need to know that as well. Direct and indirect speech, active and passive voice, figurative and literal language. But but most of these grammar-based uh, grammar based, uh, content knowledge must be contextualized and text-based grammar teaching strategies. So you can have the days of us um, uh, uh, telling our students that, you know, identify a synonym in the text. No, it's not going to, that's not what we want our students to do. We want to ask why was a synonym used in the text, for example. So it, it must be contextualized uh, text-based grammar cannot be isolated grammar, okay? You cannot learn any isolated grammar rules. And I've just explained that to you, okay? So, for example, now we're going to look at your assignment, okay? So your assignment, remember, I think I touched a little bit on question one and on question two. Now we're going to look at question three. So this question is basically going to be on the application of the uh, pedagogical content knowledge to question three. And really the question states that um, communicative language teaching CTL approaches should support language learning by assisting the learners to develop their language proficiency, proficiency pedagogically. Explain how the following two communicative language teaching approaches could develop language learning pedagogically in the lesson. So building on prior knowledge. So how can we, when looking at prior knowledge, how can build on, how can you as a teacher help the student to build on, on prior knowledge, okay? So you will say they build on familiar information so that learners can make new uh, make connections with new information and the same thing you're going to have to uh, look at when looking at uh, this uh, B 3B which would be varying interaction okay so those two questions they are very important question three provide two examples from the case that you support the pedagogic use of C so the one is would be for example prior knowledge okay how it was activate how it was activated the lesson how it activated the lesson why is it important for language learning okay so prior knowledge good readers apply what they already know to their reading this strategy helped learners to bring meaning and connections to their readings okay so there is a question there or authentic materials this is another example for example um, how teachers activate this lesson, this in the lesson, why it was important for language learning. So just another point there. And then, yeah. Now question three continues. I just indicated here, building on prior knowledge. For example, it builds on familiar information so that learners can make a connection with new information. And then also varying interaction would be independent learning, practice target language. Um, for and, and so when you're looking at the application of uh, pedagogic content knowledge to the question four and five, um, you need to understand for question four and five, discuss CLT practices that were not used in the lesson. So there's 10 practices, but we want to look, uh, we want you to look at Four, two practices that were not used in the classroom. And um, maybe remember I spoke to you about teacher talk, for example, 
do you, did you feel that maybe the teacher was speaking too too much um you know remember i said to you when it comes to communicative classroom the student needs to speak 20 percent. sorry the teacher needs to speak uh 20 percent, but the student must speak 80 percent. that you perhaps feel that there was too much talking in the classroom etc and then they want to so you need to answer question four and five that were not used in the lesson and then provide and then, so we i'm going to provide an example how one clt practice could have been activated in the lesson lesson okay why it is important as a crt language learning practice so for example let's say your answer would have been authentic material maybe there wasn't enough authentic material used and then um you need to explain how the authentic test could have illustrated tense use. So the two needs to be linked together. Okay. What you have, be, have been, what would have been an example of an integrated and text-based approach pedagogically? Question five. It cannot be not an isolated grammar task, which encourages memorization and rote learning. So if your answer is going to be, for example, reducing te teacher talk, uh, learners need opportunities to improve their language so that would have helped you you need to discuss question four um, and five discuss the CRT practices that were not used in the classroom so let's say for example you are saying reducing teacher talk time then you need to say why it is important as a CTL language learning practice so you must say to me why for example reducing teacher talk would be important um, as a CRT practice I hope this helps <laughs> Okay, so the case study question, question one, text place plus an example, communicative plus an example. So you need to say, tell me something about whether the the, the communicative, the, the case study, the teacher within the case study used a text-based approach and an example, and then a communicative approach plus example. So you have to look at both, okay? Then question two, six CRT practices and examples. So you've got 10, you need to choose six and you need to take examples from the case study and you need to use quotation marks for that. Uh, how to CRT examples develop language learning pedagogically and they've given you the case, the two, the, the two, um, um, they've used you, they've given you the two examples. Let me just make sure. The one would be building on prior knowledge. And then the other one would be a varying interaction. So you have to um, develop that pedagogically. Question four, one CLT not used. So there's 10 of those uh, CLT guidelines. One has not been used. Which one? And you have to explain uh, how, why it was not used, and then question five, how CLT in four would help language learning pedagogically. So if what you've seen in question four, for example, um, would be that reducing teacher talk, then how will reducing teacher talk help um, in the CLT classroom, okay? Then question six would provide a detailed English first additional language um, activity to support answers to question five. So let me just see there. Um, that question you have to look at. So a detailed activity to support answers to question five. So you have to give an example. Then question seven. It's a very straightforward group work is as is regarded as an important CRT practice. Now comment on management of group work by referring to two strategies. What two strategies is needed when you look at group work, for example? And then question eight, case study provides an overview of a lesson 
to ACTI, right? So you need to look at that, okay? So pre-reading, speed reading, practices of skin, scanning and skimming to predict the context of the article. So scanning and skimming and so forth. So there you need to look at that for personally. For FET, which should not concern you, for SP, prior knowledge rather than focusing on the articles, content, and then A, explain why scanning and skimming can be used as pre-reading activities. And then to answer five questions and discuss in the lessons for FET to develop next reading lesson. So SP, that is what you need to focus on. And then B, identify two pre-reading practices, examples for scanning and skimming that can be used to predict the context of the article or short story, okay? Some submission dates and turn it in. All online trackers and assignments have uh, um, have have availability and submission due date. So everything has been activated, um, and so forth. Okay. Now I just thought I would uh, speak a little bit about turn it in. So as I've mentioned in the beginning of the recording, that you need your your online turn it in. A comparison should not be more than 35%, okay? Um, if it's 50%, it means that you have not used your original work. It's, it's going to get you into trouble. 100% is even worse. So you need to always try and get below 35% when, uh, um, when looking at online trackers. Okay, so red there, it's 100%. We will not mark it. Um, 46, sorry, 62 is also problematic, 34, not too good, but we can accept it, 46, definitely not, we want to see, you want to see red, so at least 16% will be helpful, okay, I just wanted to speak to you a, bit, a little bit about the second opportunity assessment, and so this is a form that you have to complete, so let's say you cannot, you could not submit your assignment. Um, this could be because of medical reasons, death of an immediate family member, other circumstances, religious commitment and work responsibility. You, you, can, you will be given a second opportunity, but obviously you need to prove all these, if, if any of these issues uh, pertains to you, whether you've had a medical reason or the death of an immediate family member, etc. If you can prove that, you have to pay 250 rand non-refundable admin fee. Um, so you need to refer to your program's fees and payments options for banking details. And that is is what that's all I can say about that. So that's a second opportunity assessment. So now there's another thing that you need to look at. This is something that's been introduced this year. So if a lecturer, if let's say by the 4th of April, you submit your assignments and um, I discover that about two, a few people have not submitted theirs under Canvas. Now, this is the operational procedure that's going to, and you students need to know about it. The lecturer to post a reminder announcement on Canvas a week prior to due date. We've done that, that your assignment must be in on the 4th of April. So we've done that. Lecturer to message students who on Canvas not completed. So the lecturer, this will be done two days after the closing date. Okay, so the closing, the, the assignment closes on the 4th of April at 2023, 59. Um, I'm gonna look at two days afterwards. I will see how many students have not submitted their assignment. And then I will have to send a, a notice to these students to say to them that they have not submitted their assignments. Okay, and then, um, after a certain period of time, I will then have to inform uh, the disciplined leader uh, about the names of these students have not submitted the assignment, okay? And then they will take it further from there. I think I just, it's very important that you understand the procedure. So lecturer to post a reminder announcement on Canvas. That will be have to be done 
um, and I think we've completed that. The lecture to message students on Canvas not completed, so we we have that. And then after a week, the lecturer will send the names to the discipline leader or the head of school of education to inform them about it. And then that will be the case. So next we will be looking at active listening skills. Yeah, and that's the end of my recording. Hope all goes well. Please email me if you have any queries. Take care. Bye.